It's Tuesday afternoon, 4 p.m. in Switzerland. It's Space Cafe Web Talk time. Our Space Cafe Web Talk, 33 minutes with Ronald von der Breggen, will begin soon. Thanks for joining us for our talk today about NGSO systems, the imminent success or a hype after all. As always, we appreciate your participation and ongoing feedback. Any responses is, or any response is highly valuable for us and helps us to improve. I'm Torsten Greening, your host today and publisher of spacewatch.global. As you know, we are a Switzerland-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. I know many of you are already familiar with our website, our bi-weekly and daily newsletters, and the Space Cafe podcast. Check them out. It's, there are awesome conversations and it's worth your time. We also keep our fan shop open online for you to support us actively and become a space watcher. The edition one has cool items for you, your friends and the ones you love and your support is absolutely needed to keep our, our um, activities alive. If you have missed any of our previous web talks, we have an archive available on our website in the event section and later on on YouTube. My guest today is someone I absolute admire for his sharpness in intelligent analytics of SATCOM topics. Listen to him on stage is always a firework for your synapses. With that, a very warm welcome, Ronald van der Breggen. Hi. So, Ronald, um, he is the owner of Route 206, more than 20 years of experience in the telecom uh, and satellite sector, and he is native of the Netherlands. He began his career in the telecom at the Dutch Telecom incumbent KPN, rising to the position of the VP IP services. Then he joined SES as Vice President Customer Account Management. And from 2015 to 2019, he served as the Chief Commercial Officer of Leosat, where under his leadership, the company secured a 2 billion R in pre-launch commitments. With Route 206, Ronald continues to help companies with brilliant technologies to archive or or achieve commercial success through its decades of experience, structured approach, and large industry networks. He holds a PhD, uh, not a PhD, a bachelor degree in business administration from the Nienrod University, and I'm quite sure I mispronounced it, but it's somewhere in the Netherlands, as well as a master's in business telecommunication from the TU of Delft. So with that, a warm welcome again to our Space Cafe today, Ronald. So let's kick that off. I used the term NGSO earlier. Maybe you can specify first what it is, what it isn't, and what we will address today. Thank you, Torsten, and it's it's a pleasure to uh, be here. We have uh, met so many times in so many places of the world and to now meet uh, online during this pandemic is uh, is so befitting of the day and age that we're living in so happy to be here and, and happy to talk about this uh, topic that is very near and dear to me um, as for ngso um, uh, abbreviation for uh, non-geosynchronous orbits and so that kind of implies that everything else is geosynchronous which is indeed the very uh, bread and butter of this industry, geosynchronous meaning that you can hold a, and I don't know how detailed we have to be here, probably is a whole bunch of satellite folks here listening into, so probably I'm just preaching to the choir, but you know, for the sake of completeness, let's just uh, uh, define it then. Um, geosynchronous systems, you can bold an antenna on the top of your roof, you can glue it down because it's pointed in one direction to a satellite that is moving as fast as the Earth is moving. And so therefore, relatively speaking, it is in complete standstill, allowing you to indeed bolt that antenna down. So anything that is not uh, in standstill mode, anything that is moving uh, technically is uh, in a non-geo uh, synchronous uh, orbit. Um, but make no mistake, um, uh, the, the workhorse of this industry still is is a geo or the satellites in the geo system. Mm -hmm. um, that's where all the money is coming from nowadays. Still, that is where all the applications are, at least those that are very well defined, 
That is where all the system integrators make their money. That has created a fantastic ecosystem today. And, and NGSO, of course, is, is relatively new. Um, the, the NGSO orbits that are most uh, well known are those in Mio and Leo. And I think that's mm -hmm. gonna be what we're gonna be talking about today also mostly. But there's also um, uh, HEO, the, the highly elliptical uh, orbits, and arguably satellites in an inclined orbit in, in, in GEO when they come to an, an end of life can also be deemed to be uh, NGSO systems. Uh, but okay, that is stretching uh, the truth uh, a little bit. As for NGSO, um, I'm gonna limit myself today mostly to uh, NGSOs being used for data communication. And there's a lot of them out there also doing remote sensing, be it heat or be it uh, CO2 or you know whatever else, um, arguably cows and, and, and sheep. Then we get more in the IoT business, but that's more of a store and forward type uh, application. Um, I am having the data background that I have more interested in anything that is uh, a 24 seven uptime and allows you to use these system uh, continuously for which you then meet a, a lot of satellites simply because as I mentioned, they're not in standstill. So whenever you have locked into something, you know that a couple of minutes later, it'll be over the horizon. And I ideally, or arguably you should have a new one because to look at, because if you don't, then your service has just been interrupted. So hopefully that, uh, that gives a, a bit of an overview as to what I mean with, uh, with NGSO systems. So we are focusing on, on sat SATCOM then primarily? Mostly, or, yeah, and, yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, you're both on one hand side, a great supporter, as well as an outspoken critic of the NGSO systems. And many of your opinion pieces also published on, on spacewatch.global reflect that. Um, and that's, if you're in the audience, haven't read them, it's, it's worth to read them because they are, again, as I mentioned earlier, super sharp in the analytics. So can you put that paradox as it sounds into a context? So what are the critical questions to ask today? So. Um, yeah, of course. Um, so the paradox. Well, um, if there's any doubt, I am a very fond uh, supporter or believer, I should say, in anything NGSO. Let me just unequivocally say that I am a huge supporter. And the reason for that is pretty straightforward. Uh, I have a data background. I uh, uh, come from the data communication industry, uh, terrestrial data communication industry. One, two, I think the world is getting more and more digital today. Um, everybody knows that uh, we're walking around with cell phones in our hands and we're not using it for, for phone calls anymore. Um, I think next in line are household appliances that are gonna be connected uh, to the cloud. I am yet to see what the benefit will be of my refrigerator talking to the cloud, but that's a discussion in and of itself. Um, but but I can tell I you what, my, my, my will complain all the time. <laughs> well, you know, you can, you can argue uh, and, and laugh about it, but I think we, all can, we can all agree that there's just more and more data out there. And mm -hmm. simply as a function of satellites in a lower orbit being better able to support data, I think ultimately the geo orbits will completely empty out and it will, the satellites will ultimately end up in, in LEO orbits. Um, we can debate whether it will take years or decades or, or longer, but um, that I think is the, the, the direction in which we're moving. I'm not a big fan of hybrid models either. That being said, you know, if you, in this intermediate period, you can get your return on capital uh, within a finite period in which you have these hybrid systems up and running, you know, that's, that's great, fantastic, go and do it. But as an, as an end game, I think um, geos will empty out. Leos is the future. And again, we can, we can debate how long it will take. As for being critical, um, I don't think being critical means that you're not a supporter. I'm, I'm critical of my kids sometimes. They're in their 20s. And if they take a left turn and I think they should go right, I, I call it out. And sometimes they thank me for providing new insights that they hadn't thought of. And sometimes I'm, I'm just an old man from a different generation and I shoot up. 
uh, so I should shut up, which is fine too, I guess. But in no way, shape, or form does that mean that I'm not supporting them. I am their biggest uh, biggest cheerleader. So, so I think in that sense, the, the paradox is not really a paradox because being critical doesn't mean you're not supported. The bigger question is, of course, why? Why do I write these pieces? Why am I critical? And and that has um, everything to do with the fact that I'm not an engineer. So while I do share the excitement of um, having an engineering success, having worked uh, five years or more with some seed money on a project and finally getting it launched and then you get your first data packets back from space and then the champagne corks are flying around. I, I, I certainly get the excitement and I am as excited, I guess, but when you know the corks are on the floor, then I'm like, okay, so what problem were we exactly solving and, and who had that problem? And will they be the ones using you to solve that problem? And do they have the money to pay you for that? And if they pay you for solving that problem, will they continue to come back and have you continue to do that? And if you look in the rear view mirror, who is behind you? And are they already trying to take over uh, or take you over? So these are the things that are not making you immediately popular, but it is what comes to mind. So I. I am a firm believer in that you need to have a vision for the future and you need to have a path towards profitability. These are two key concepts for me. And what I mean by that is if take for instance, the mobile telephony industry, you and I are both old enough to know how this thing came up in the mid eighties and was a giant success, turned out to be a giant success in the nineties. The first networks, they were compared to today's standards, can I say so? They were crap, but they, they sold fantastic voice services on that. They sold it to executives of deep pocketed companies and they convinced them that don't use these telephone services in your car, you're missing out on a whole bunch of business and you know, you're in for trouble. So they were wildly successful despite the service not being optimal. And I'm being kind now, they, made lots of profits, they put the profits back in the network, they grew the network bigger, had more capacity, and now they went after consumer markets. Now, in consumer markets, obviously the prices had to drop drastically, margins eroded, but because the volume was off the charts, they made, again, a lot of profits, put that back in the network. Now they started developing data services, starting out with simple SMS services, and later, you know, by now we can serve the internet uh, better on your cell phone than sometimes you can on the laptop back home. So there's a clear vision for the future. There's a clear path towards profitability. And in this case, there are intermediate steps that uh, first network, first generation, second generation, that allow you to demonstrate the proof of concept, that allow you to demonstrate the success, and even provides an opportunity to investors to come in and exit. So, so that is what I'm, what I'm looking for. It's to some, I'm using the metaphor of, if you want to be the, the king of racetracks, you know, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you're into racing. We had a, a weekend in Spa Formula One this weekend, which I guess doesn't generate a lot of fans, but anyway. But if you want to be king of racetracks, you start up with a small racetrack. You have a few go-karts running around. When that is successful, you make the track bigger and wider. Now come the BMWs in and the Porsches, you make more profits, you put it back in the, in the racetrack and before you know it you're hosting formula one and, and indycar events vision for the future clear path towards profitability and intermediate steps now let's go back to ngso what we were you know talking about do we see that there not so much i think what we see instead is a pandemonium of news um, with uh, news items rolling over each other each and every day we're going to mars launch delays, we're fully funded through a spec, chapter 11 somewhere else, um, satellites being launched over here, but problems because the satellites turn out to be twice as expensive over there, and on and on it goes. And I don't know about some of you, but sometimes I find myself flicking through these news articles like, like my daughter's going through TikTok videos, right? I mean, it's the one after the other and the next, and you, you 
and really there's only one message that I'm waiting for, even after eight years, I haven't seen it, which is, which is coming from SES saying that O3B has generated this much profits, profits, not revenues, profits in contribution to the bottom line of SES. Because I think that is what is needed. This is what would demonstrate a path to profitability. This is what demonstrate these intermediate, one of these intermediate steps. So um, yeah, I, this vision for the future I, is, 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 it just keeps coming back to me. And the one that's being offered now in NGSO mostly for datacom is this gateway-based internet access type product to bridge the digital divide, which is fantastically important. Do not get me wrong, but as a viable business model, uh, I th it's questionable. Let's be uh, nice about it. And, and I think that's proven with, you know, OneWeb has recently come out of a chapter 11. Starlink is now solidly uh, factoring in the $1 billion in funding they're getting from the US government. They're funding 75% of the antenna they're putting out there. So uh, there's some writing on the wall. On, on the wall. Uh, that you know this may not work out, and granted, um, you now do see that these companies and, and O3B certainly is, is doing that, uh, and, and I think OneWeb and SpaceLink are doing the very same, is to also try and position these services in other markets, like government or cruise, <laughs> and yeah, that that does give me a, a, a chuckle from time to time because you know it's. <laughs> It's like going to the bank and say, okay, I, I want to open up a soup kitchen because I want to make this world a better place and I need a loan. And then if you get the loan, you figure, hmm, let's, let's open up a sushi restaurant instead. And then the bank comes to check on the money and say, hey, listen, um, what's this? I had expected to see something else. And then you go like, well, once I had the money, I figured out that the soup kitchen really didn't work really well from a business model perspective. So I decided to open up a sushi restaurant instead. Well, fantastic. Um, it's great that you had this epiphany, uh, Einstein, but is that not something you could have thought of before you started borrowing money? Or in the case of NGSO, before you started designing satellites? Because here you are now using satellites that are designed for one thing, using it for another. And there's a thousand ways you can design satellites. We all know that. So to make it fit for purpose is a thing in and of itself. And while I appreciate people moving sideways in an effort to get business, enter into business models that work, um, it is a missed opportunity in terms of the design of the satellite. So as you can tell, these are the things that get me worked up uh, from time to time. And, and back to your point, that's, in an effort to cleanse the mind, I, I put pen to paper. And uh, if that then produces uh, opinion pieces that uh, people enjoy reading, then, um, then um, you know, at least it served a purpose. So, so that's, that's well, the reason behind all that. <laughs> keep on doing that. I mean, we enjoy our publishing that are definitely because, I mean, we, we might be among the TikToks you mentioned earlier with having all these news about Mars, Moon, whatever, out on on our site, or, right. um, because we we like the pluralism, or in and sure, in that, no, no, it's not criticism. Make it make it offering. No, of course. So, but let's move on here. I mean, what you just said, combined with your own experience in LeoSat, and can you share a bit or about that one? I mean, without of course going into the secret detail of what happened, but what are the lessons learned from the Leo Sat times? I mean, it was a obviously you had a great time, and and yes. seeing you during that time on stage, I mean, um, you could see this pleasure you have with with that. So, or tell us what what are the lessons learned now? Well. Uh... <laughs> Uh, and I'm saying this with a smirk on my face, but if you're gonna, if you're coming into a cash crunch, uh, 2021 is a much better year to do that in space than, than 2019. Because right now it seems that people are throwing money at anything that has space in the name like never before through specs and other vehicles. 
So, so that's definitely a, a lesson learned. Um, but um, yeah, no, in, in all honesty, I think there's many lessons learned, um, uh, but they're mainly positive. Don't forget, I mean, you said it in your, intro, in your introduction, we had um, a great customer take up um, and achieve numbers that are still out there uh, being in the top, top three, if not on number one, which as one should be something we're all very proud of still. Um, but yeah, it, it, at the same time, that gives me a lot of confidence for companies like the Yoset uh, to still have an opportunity out there uh, that's going to be, you know, fantastic. Um, but anyway, back to the question, lessons learned. I, I think the major lesson learned, um, and one that I want to share here um, with you happily, is, is this. Earlier, I talked about having this vision for the future. And I, I think if you are in this NGO business um, and you want to or have to develop a vision for the future, um, you have to look outside of satellite. Uh, we're in data communication, so you have to look on the data communication side. And for that, you have to turn to the experts in that field. And those are not in the satellite industry. Those are the terrestrial guys. And you have to engage with them. You have to see what problems they have. And they have quite a few. They have quite a few. I mean, um, we, we can name a few. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Having capacity in the right places is a big issue for anything terrestrial. And I don't mean internet access capacity is mm -hmm. what we constantly are talking about here on satellite. I mean, ducts and fibers and wavelengths or, or colors if you want, or if you want to interconnect on, on a network level, I'm talking about ATM, IP, for like here, X25 or, or whatever. Um, it's not in all the places. And what's more important, to get it there, it takes has implementation times that are sometimes through the roof, which is not helpful if you, as an operator, are asked to provide um, uh, relief or recovery for, you know, situations that we now see all too often uh, with hurricanes and floods and um, forest fires and, and what have you. So, so this whole rapid deployment is a big issue. If you, if you are there, you're pretty much the only one. So that from a backup perspective, there's not much uh, available, which is also an issue. Latency is something we think is an issue in satellite. Well, some of us do. There's a few folks that think it's not an issue, but that's a topic in and of itself. Um, but latency is also an issue in the terrestrial world. Japan to the US, multiple routes. All the, all, all the latency is just not good, let's put it that way. Um, scalability. Um, if you have uh, an oil rig in the in the Gulf of Mexico, nicely wired up through a, a radio link from the shore, and think that works fine for you in the North Sea, well, think twice because why? If you're another area, you got different operators, different hardware, different software, different everything. So that's an issue. And let's not, let's not even begin to talk about security, right? I mean, that's another one of those where. Uh, that's front page, left, right, and center. So, so that's that's uh, that's you can do multiple space cafes on that. Now, talk, talk, talking about uh, the, the latency, I think you guys are you, while are in, in Leo said you made this calculation that from Singapore to God knows where via a satellite, it's a faster connection than on the terrestrial. Uh, is is that true? Is that proven? Um, I mean, you haven't been in space, but was that our showcase? Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Well, I mean, if the proof of the pudding is in the eating, that means that you have to have all these satellites up there before you can really demonstrate that through. But if you just run the numbers and do the physics, then that's absolutely true. And it was also acknowledged as being true, given some of the contracts that we did with, in this case, um, high frequency traders that were completely willing and able and ready to put their money on that. So, so, but, but you know, good that you bring that up because you raised the point I was trying to make uh, already in advance, which is all of these issues that I mentioned, or none of these issues that I mentioned, I should say, can be solved easily with terrestrial systems. And the irony of all of it is using satellites, they can, they can 
mostly be they I'm, I'm, I'm got to rephrase that using using satellites they can all be solved security okay that's a separate discussion but certainly there are security aspects when it comes to getting data from one place to another there are great solutions using satellites that you could never provide using terrestrial systems so so there's a multitude of opportunities out there i think that's the major lesson learned but for some reason or another, and I said it before, this industry is still very much hell-bent on talking about gateway-based internet access using satellite. And <laughs> to some I've, I've said, it's like, it's like the pizza margarita syndrome is what I've called it. If you're in the pizza industry, then this is an industry that can only look at the pizza margarita, which is the basics, the most basic of pizzas. And we talk about the sauce and we talk about the crust. Should it be thicker? Should it be thinner? The size, should it be larger? Should it be smaller? The dough, should it be different so that you know it, it's, it stays warm long enough so we can bring it out farther in our delivery process? And I am just thinking, why is there nobody that stands up and says, let's, let's, grab a bunch of mushrooms, throw it on there, <laughs> call it a piece of fungi, charge twice the price, and now see what that does. And, but no, it, we just keep coming back to gateway-based internet. And yeah, for Leo's set perspective, I think we were not a piece of fungi. We were pre pretty much a, a quattro stagioni because we had everything on there basically. And, you know, it, it really resonated with, uh, with customers. And so I think, that's a major lesson learned and i think it's still applicable today um so yeah there you go i like having a dutch explaining the pizza business that's yeah. cool i mean now, now i get it so maybe that's... i should use flamkuchen or pannenkuchen right <laughs> this would be more fitting I, I Bulletin for us so yeah. however um <laughs> listen, listening very careful what you said i mean is there still a market for satellite communication in leo for new entrants or i mean do we give up on the existing one to whatever starlink one web in this field or uh, 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 where, where's this market i would even so the answer is yes okay but i would even go further than that i i think it's an absolute must that we get uh, somebody in there um use with this kind of talk uh, with this kind of value proposition because it now seems that success in, in this NGSO industry is being defined as um, getting spec if you want, right? If we, if we get the funding in, be it through a spec or whatever it is, then we declare success. Or if we get government funding, we, we declare success. Mm -hmm. But of course, real successes are very different. It is defined by customers that are willing to buy your service and, and continue to come back. And, and, and I think in NGSO, uh, we are a long way from, uh, we're a long away from that, right? I mean, mm -hmm. the industry, the satellite industry has had fantastic business cases. Um, you've, you've been in the industry just as much as I have been to know that uh, in, the, in the DTH world, if you launch a new satellite and announce that customers could start buying on Friday morning, uh, 7 a.m., and they should send their request to this fax number, then 10 past seven, the satellite was already sold out. Now, granted, those days have gone, but that is the real definition of success. And so, um, yeah, it's just odd that this industry is, is NGSO and data is still being carried by, by, by those types of video revenues um and through money that is coming in through specs and through or or other means and by government funding mm -hmm. but but not by data revenues it, that's maybe like now overall 10 percent, 20 percent, maybe not even that and so yeah that that is quite an, an irony data is the future but um yeah. yeah so anyway we need we need an ngso like Leo said, who, who clearly outlines that they understand data, that they understand telco partnerships, that talk the telco language, not just in a sales situation, but also in the CTO office um, and around the, uh, the drawing boards and um, are all about designing what I've also 
started calling Cisco's in space rather than satellites that can carry data. Oh, you're it, talking it, to an ex Tricom guy about Cisco. Well, there that you go. Hurts. That hurts. Well, I mean, so it resonates with you, but many think this is just semantics, but mm -hmm. I, I don't think it is. I, I think that is, that's this change in mentality that I think is, is important. <laughs> and, and mind you, Torsten, I mean, you're not doing it just for yourself to build a company and then try and be successful. I think in part, you're doing it for the entire industry. There's a big value chain here of software companies, hardware companies, modems, components, uh, integrators. Uh, if if this, this thing does not fly, then, you know, there's more at stake than just a few companies tumbling over. So, so I think it's really critical mm -hmm. that these companies uh, are entering the market. Um, uh, not just for themselves, but for, you know, the industry as a whole. I, I would like to pick on the, the, the role of the telcos in the, in the SATCOM field, as you, as you alluded to that. Um, I mean, we talk now about 5G in rollout or available already, uh, bringing these networks together, mm -hmm. 6G on the horizon. Um, the, the latest rumor we, we just hear is that the iPhone 13 has a Leo satellite communication are built in. So if we have all these super cool networks on the ground, so and and putting that together with these whatever 10%, 20% data services you mentioned before. So what is the role here? I mean, I think all of the big telcos have their shares in in, in satellite operators, as far as I know. So I mean Deutsche Telekom had had it definitely or in, in a few using their own services now. But can you allude on that a bit more? Sure. Um, well, I, I think already made it clear that they, the role will be important. Um, and moreover, I think, no, I know that they're also very interested in, in speaking about this topic with the satellite industry. I mean, we had multiple conversations with them and, and still today I got friends in, in, in that world that are very keenly looking at the opportunities in space. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it's it's a party that wants to be at, uh, at the table. Don't forget, um, I'm not so sure about the investments that they have today, Torsten, but what is certainly true is that back in the day when the internet bubble was growing and growing, every, every incumbent operator, every terrestrial operator basically had had satellites themselves. They were a satellite operator effectively. And they did away with that when uh, kilobits uh, and, and megabits uh, turned to be gigabits and what have you. But back in the day, they had them for backup and, and you know, certain trunks were, were satellite trunks more than they were um, terrestrial trunks. So um, I see a role for them uh, first as, as guiding our industry, like I said before, um, when it comes to data com, uh, nobody takes, uh, uh, nobody, they're not taking any back seat. I mean, these guys know what they're talking about. And, and I think mm -hmm. we would be uh, foolish not to uh, talk to them before we started designing satellites, period. Secondly, okay. I think their role as a marketing partner is, is fantastic. We already, uh, dip their toe into that when, when at Leo said, I think these guys are having such a powerful network where they can position their services and add satellite services on top of it in a way that satellite could never achieve themselves. And then of course, extending that into becoming a sales partner is even more, more fantastic. I mean, right now, when we do gateway-based internet access, we found, or we find telcos to be our competitor. You, you build rural telephony pockets, sorry, rural um, data connection pockets into in, in certain areas. And the moment you start developing some critical mass, that's when telcos come in, they fiber their way in, they microwave their way in, and they steal your business away from you. So, so this industry is not too fond of telcos, mostly because they, they steal our internet access business away. But if you can work side by side in sol solving some problems that I described earlier, uh, their sales network is, is second to none. And if they, it's so granular, it is so well developed. If you can tap into that, then that just, that just is 
a, a, an unbelievable boost to your business. So I think they're going to be a critical player in going forward for this industry if they take, yeah, you know, if we take them more seriously than we do today. Cool. Cooperation can help sometimes. I, I get it. I would like to pick a, uh, on one question from Mark. Um, he sent over uh, that one. So how limited is a resource orbit itself for um, our NGSO operators? Do you see there's a shortage or you say- This is more in the context of um, uh, availability of spectrum, I take it. Uh, orbits, more the physical orbits, or I, I would uh, assume, but of course, spectrum pl plays into that uh, as well. I mean, that well, goes hand in hand, as we know. Um, so th that's that's a great question, and, and I, I don't think there is an, an easy answer to that. There are the space debris guys that say we're already overcrowding things today. Um, there is an ITU who needs to do spectrum. Uh, analysis and uh, prior and to give priorities, and mm -hmm. they need to they need to uh, have uh, uh, software information systems that track and trace everything, which I think is a, is a challenge in and of itself, even even today, which could lead to some limitations as a result of that. Um, on the other hand, the Leo orbit is 500 kilometers to 1500 kilometers. There is a whole bunch of layers you can do there. Secondly, um, it's called space for a reason. There, there is a lot of room, and and you know the guys that are in the space debris, uh, active in the space debris um, area will will disagree with me. And so I am oversimplifying, I, I know, but the point I'm trying to make is, depending on which which lens you look through, there's there's multiple ways to answer this question. What's with what's going on today? Um, and that I think is important. There are multiple ways to fill the orbits. You can go like Spacelink, where you flood the orbits with hundreds, with thousands of satellites. And I think there's also a more uh, conservative way, whereby constellations are in the area of 100 to 150 satellites that allow you to put up a system that can pull terabits of data, which I think. Is, is going to be great for uh, services that you can sell through telcos as a premium service. And so it doesn't really require you to flood these, these orbits. So the question is, is there enough room? I tend to think the answer is yes, but that doesn't, it doesn't uh, mean that you can just go and, and launch like crazy and, and leave the problems for later. So. Yeah. I think that that goes very well. Your answer goes very well, or, or leads over to my my next question. Almost last question is, how do you see the chances and the needs, or as we are Euro Europeans here, um, for the European, let's call them a Breton constellation yeah. Oh, yeah, for, yeah, for yeah. the moment. So, um, will that has a chance? And is there um, any? Well, I so um, again, this is. Europe is a, is, a, is, a, is a great continent. I, I love living here. Um, when it comes to politics, it's a little bit more uh, difficult. Uh, that is, uh, the European uh, Union really is not uh, a government. It is an intergovernmental institution and it's designed to support the cooperation amongst its member states. That is very different from a federal government. So part of what's going on today is uh, just building uh, now, trying to get a mandate to spend money on a constellation, which you do, ironically enough, through the use of old space companies writing reports that the new mm -hmm. space world is going to be fantastically uh, lucrative, which is, which is interesting. But for our American friends, it, it's like NASA having to go for each and every product uh to find approval uh, in in all the states they have to go from alabama to wyoming um and and everything in between the alphabet uh, and and get a signature that's that's just but anyway this is how european politics work so back to the question will it will it will it work if they get the mandate i hope that they limit themselves to a single mission type of um constellation that 
is able to, and here we go again, she can show a clear path towards profitability. Um, and it needs to be rock solid because with Galileo, people are already promising that 70% would be paid by, by enterprises that turn out to be 0%. So people are gonna be skeptical. But anyway, single mission, a clear path towards profitability and then execute it in almost a, a military type fashion because if you have the momentum, you need to act on it and need to act on it quickly. And if you, if you try to uh, you know, th work through a consensus model, as, as good as that may be, it, it may cause for delays that you may not be able to recoup. So single mission, clear path to profitability and execute like, like crazy. I think that is, that, is the, that is the key to success for, for this type of uh, constellation from the European Union. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. I know my my production team is, is going going nuts right now because we are Hello. running over time oh. uh, already, uh, and their signal are that we uh -oh. do so. But I don't want to end without asking: What are you doing today, and what is the mysterious route to six? Doing. Nothing mysterious, nothing mysterious. I'm helping small companies with their commercial strategy. People always believe if they've got great technology, it will be sold tomorrow. That's not how it works. Um, I remember people think that if you that cell phones are being sold themselves, because if a new cell phone comes out, everybody buys it. I, I, I still, back in the day, this is a funny story, I, I, we paid people to stand out front of the central station in Amsterdam here with a cell phone uh, and then to talk into it like the whole day, um, simply to basically create acceptance of people using phones in the street. And of course, they got the looks of why are you doing this in front uh, and outside of the central station? If you want to make a phone call, why don't you go home? But hey, there you go. This proves that the assumption that everybody has that if you have great technology, it will be sold automatically is not true. You need to really invest into it. And in this case, we really paid actors to do that. Now, I'm not going as far as that, but to help small companies with their commercial strategies by identifying the needs that they can tap into and providing the narrative that will uh, resonate with these type of customers is, is uh, what I'm doing. I have uh, two good colleagues of me who help me with that. Um, so that's one part. And the other part of the business is to help bigger companies figuring out a way to navigate through this uh, satellite world that is changing very rapidly. And I think we've talked about that uh, in abundance uh, in the past half hour. Um, because, um, you know, many of them are sitting on the sideline uh, waiting for winners and losers to shake out, but mm -hmm. in doing so, they run the risk of being uh, shaken out themselves as a loser, and, and that's not, you know, what they intend to do, of course. So, helping them navigate through this changing world by uh, coming up with strategies where they can tap into some of the money that's being spent, because money is being spent, mm -hmm. as we know, and um, for others that are, you know, more in the, in the, in the, in the integration or uh, um, value-added reseller market, for them to help them come up with a narrative to their customers that indicates that uh, they're on top of things, which uh, helps their customers figuring out the best decisions for, for, yeah, for them, which sometimes is to uh, stay with geos or to, uh, invest into uh, NGSO systems or mm -hmm. something else is of real value to these bigger organizations that, uh, because, you know, their customers need uh, leadership. They need somebody who tells them where things are going. Um, and that's quite uh, a task nowadays, given, like I said in the earlier, this pandemonium of news to which you are contributing, but I, I wouldn't discourage you to do so. So please continue to do that um, because it will make my life uh, very uh, fruitful in terms of being able to help people understand what it all means and, and what you should derive from it. And, and certainly what you, what you should not derive from it. So yeah, that's, that's what I do and cool. I enjoy doing Thank that. You. I'm afraid we have to come to an end now, finally, even so I would like to uh, continue this inspiring talk with you. But no, I sure enjoyed doing will... this. I, I forgot track of time. My apologies for that. No problem, no problem. I mean, it's 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 interesting how fast 33 minutes are, are moving or if you have fun. Yeah. So but be assured that we will 
continue following SATCOM developments, constellations in our future Space Cafe web talks and in our magazine. So before we finish today, uh, please do not miss the, the upcoming events. We have a really a, a big bouquet of, uh, of events are lined up for, for you. Tomorrow for our German speaking community, we have our a special space cafe or um, Germany with the top German politicians are about or um, Germany after the elections. Interesting one. Then our, on the 2nd of September, we have our next space cafe Scotland or uh, with Angela Mattis. Then on Friday, we have the next space cafe Russia by Elena Morozova talking um, with our with her guest about Russia and space tourism, but it will be in Russian or language or as usual. So next week I will talk with two wonderful uh, people again or uh, with Niels Eldering from ESER and Professor René Oli from the Rotterdam uh, University for Management or uh, about space education. 9th of September, the next uh, our space bar by Astro Agency, our friends in Scotland, and on the 10th of September, we have our next Space Cafe Australia by Annie Handmar. So on, on the 14th, so in two weeks, I will speak with Lukas, and I'm quite sure I, I mispronounce his last name, Wilczynski, are about the European Rover Challenge that goes on in these days. So all events are going to be online on Eventbrite, and as always, we would like to hear your feedback, so please check in with us on Twitter, on Facebook, and on LinkedIn. Don't forget to sign up to our daily or bi-weekly news newsletters. And if you like to treat yourself with something special, become a Space Watcher today. Your support will help us. Take your credit card, visit our fan shop at shop.spacewatch.global. I'm sure I said it before, but it's the truth. We need your support. Thank you very much for your interest today, and thank you, Ronald, for this absolute inspiring talk and being my guest. And thanks again to this entire team behind the scenes for doing their great job so seamlessly day by day, week by week. Again, hope you all will stay safe and stay healthy. Thanks for joining us today. Hope to see you next time. In the meantime, visit our website, follow us on social media, and don't forget, become a space watcher. Thank you very much. <laughs>